People have lots of different views about God, don't they? Uh, what your view of God is, uh, some people would believe that there is a God maybe who made them, but he's very distant, just distant and separate and just leaving us to it, creator but not involved. Some people, and maybe, you know, Christians, we can, we can have this idea as well of maybe God being a bit stern and a bit harsh with us, as in someone who is looking at our lives and waiting for us to trip up. And then not being very pleased with us when we make mistakes, punishing us. We can fall into that, can't we, as Christians? God, in the Bible, describes himself as our Father. To those who are in Christ, he is our Father. He is one who comes and draws close to us because of Jesus Christ. And he wants us to know him and to know his intimate love, his intimate love for us. God is not someone who will abandon us or punish us because Jesus Christ has taken our punishment. This is what we're going to explore over this series. It's going to be an exciting series. And I think it will help us in lots of ways. I think for some of us, it might be informative, as in to know God better, to know more about God. It might help us to walk more closely with him. But I think also for some of us, it might be a healing process. I wonder what our experiences of fathers has been. Maybe positive, maybe negative, maybe a mixture of both. What healing does God want to bring us in our lives through knowing him as our father who will never leave us or let us down? This is something for men and women. Some subjects um, uh, you might think are touchy-feely subjects, and we think, oh, maybe that's not for me. But this is for everybody. To know God as our Father is something that we all need to experience for ourselves. And for, that, for us who are in Christ, I encourage you, keep going. Um, and uh, this should be really great for us. So we're going to have two readings today as we think about on our, in our first our first uh, part of this topic is topical, isn't it? It's, a lot of the time we do Bible books. This is a topical series. We're going to have an Old Testament and a New Testament reading today as we think about how our Father made us and shaped us for his glory. Um, and so Adam and Tamara, if you both want to maybe come up and follow on from each other. Adam's going to read to us from Isaiah 43. It's coming up on the screen if you don't have a Bible. If you do, it's really good to, to, to have it open in front of you anyway, so you can refer to it. Um, so we're going to go to Isaiah 43, verses 1 to 7. But now, this is what the Lord says. He who created you, O Jacob, he who formed you, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have summoned you by name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And when you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. The flames will not set you ablaze. For I am the Lord, your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Saviour. I gave Egypt for your ransom, Cush and Seba in your stead. Since you are precious and honoured in my sight, and because I love you, I will give men in exchange for you and people in exchange for your life. Do not be afraid, for I am with you. I will bring your children from the east and gather you from the west. I will say to the north, give them up, and to the south, do not hold them back. Bring my sons from afar and my daughters from the ends of the earth. Everyone who is called by my name, whom I created for my glory, whom I formed and made. That's great, thank you. That's our Old Testament reading. Um, I want to keep your fingers in there. I know it's difficult to keep your finger in on, on your phone, but we're going to go back to it. And then our New Testament reading is uh, from Ephesians chapter 1, verses 3 to 14. I want to just give them, give them a second, give them a chance. I know you're there. <laughs> Okay, great. Let us give thanks to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, for in our union with Christ he has blessed us by giving us every spiritual blessing in the heavenly world. Even before the world was made, God had already chosen us to be his 
through our union with Christ, so that we would be holy and without fault before him. Because of his love, God has already decided that through Jesus Christ, he would make us his sons and daughters. This was his pleasure and purpose. Let us praise God for his glorious grace, for the free gift he gave us in his dear son. For by the blood of Jesus Christ, we are set free. That is, our sins are forgiven. How great is the grace of God, which he gave to us in such large measure. In all his wisdom and insight, God did what he had purposed and made known to us the secret plan he had already decided to complete by means of Christ. This plan, which God will complete when the time is right, is to bring all creation together, everything in heaven and on earth, with Christ as head. All things are done according to God's plan and decision, and God chose us to be his own people in union with Christ because of his own purpose, based on what he had decided from the very beginning. Let us then, who were first to hope in Christ, praise God's glory. And you also became God's people when you heard his true message, the good news that brought you salvation. You believed in Christ, and God put his stamp of ownership on you by giving the the Holy Spirit he had promised. The Spirit is the guarantee that we shall receive what God has promised his people, and this assures us that God will complete freedom to those who are his. Let us praise his glory. Thank you. Thanks very much. All right, just sort of keep those in front of you. The other things that we'll refer to as well as we go through. Here's the question to start with. <clears throat> Can God really be called Father? Ask that question just now. You know, how do you feel or what goes through your mind with God being described as Father. Of course, using that term, it implies if God is our Father, that he made us, that he is our creator, that we owe our existence to him. But if he is not simply our maker, but he can be known as Father, it means that we can build a relationship with him. He's not just our creator who is separate and apart and distant, but he is someone that we can know and draw close to. Question is, what sort of father is he? Maybe when you hear the word father, um, you think of protection and provision and warmth and kindness. Maybe that's what you first think of. Or maybe you don't. Uh, Maybe your experience of father has been very different. Maybe your own father was harsh, selfish, maybe even absent. So what does that mean when we think about God being father then? Will God act in the same way as I've experienced from my earthly father? Or even if I come to understand that God is a good father, might I struggle to relate to him because I still carry the wounds of my past and my formative years that just, just I, I, I'm struggling for healing, you know? How do I relate to a God who's supposed to be a good father when my other experience has not been? Good question to ask, isn't it? The idea as well as we, as we go forward, which is um, if, if the idea of God as father might conclude or bring us to the conclusion that God, therefore, is a man. Is that true? Is God a man? Should we relate to him in that way? Is that just an outdated concept where, you know, patriarchal times and societies where women are suppressed and not valued for their positive qualities? What sort of portrayal of God do we have in our minds? But what does the Bible actually say? How does God want to show himself? How is he revealing himself? What's your experience of him in reality? That's where we want to start from today. Um, during the process of writing her recent book, which is called God is Not a White Man, this lady here, um, Shine McDonald, as she was writing it, she stopped using the male uh, pronoun for God, the masculine pronoun. She stopped using it. Um, two things happened as she was writing the book. One, she didn't like the fact that um, often the portrayal of God and Jesus seems to reflect a... Uh, pervasive 
white supremacy in society. So therefore, she says, God is not white, as others might have portrayed him. But she also came to the conclusion that she couldn't relate to God as a he either. So she, comes, she says in a recent interview, not only was God not white, I came to understand that God was not a man either. She admits, of course, that you know, the majority of the times where God refers to himself in the Bible is male, but let's think about the other occasions as well where God is referred to in other senses. Let's, let's look at them. Look, for example, in Genesis 1.27, it says that both male and female were created in God's image. Absolutely true, right? Um, Hosea 13, uh, God is pictured like a protective mother bear robbed of her cubs. Isaiah uh, describes God as a mother who, who bore us, who nurses us, who comforts us. And um, even Jesus in the Gospels, do you remember that time in the Gospels where uh, Jesus portrays himself like a mother hen longing to gather um, uh, God's people like chicks under his wing? There's, um, there's a church that's just on, on the Mount of Olives opposite Jerusalem with the valley in between. Um, and the church here, you can see a picture of just looking out the window of the church. Um, it's called Dominus Flevit, which means the Lord wept. You know that time when Jesus wept over Jerusalem um, and he just longed to gather them. And um, there's a, a, a mosaic in the church there. Can you see it? A mosaic of a mother hen referring to the verse where Jesus is wanting to have that nurturing and protecting, but, but, but weeping over the people that didn't respond um, and follow God properly. So, we see that Scripture shows that God possesses both what we might call traditional male and female qualities. But of course, that must be true, right? Because God created all the qualities that there are. He made everything. He embodied, well, doesn't embody, but he lives in his character with all those characteristics. Um, So, us as men and women, we're created, of course, equal by God, but we are created distinct and different for a good purpose. We are there to complement each other and to, within our families, as parents, say, but just in society generally, we are there to image God and to show a, full, a fuller reflection by who we are made in the image of God, of who God really is. Of course, we can be in, a danger, of, in danger of overemphasizing maybe stereotypical or traditional qualities that men and women have, got to be careful of that. Um, So men, for example, um, if we want to grow in the Lord in every way, maybe some of us need to develop nurturing side to our character and kindness in ways that maybe our wives or or women comes more naturally. We all want to grow, don't we, in who God wants us to be. And also when we think about single parent families, we know and we pray that God will compensate for what is lacking within a family. But it is no mistake that God's design is for both the man and the woman, the the, the husband, the wife, mum and the dad, to complement each other in reflecting God in the way that they parent and love and bring up their children. And, And dare I say it, especially, especially a godly man walking with Christ in the way that they bring up their children. I'll never forget, I'll never forget, in the, in the early days of us living in Paul's Grove, moving here, when Ben was young, our first son, when he was young, and um, took him to the playground just down from our road, um, playing in a little playground there, some other children who were just on their own playing there, And there was one little girl that that was looking over at us. And then after a a, a little while, she turned around to me and said, your boy is lucky. She said, is that your son? I said, yeah. She said, he's lucky. And I said, what do you mean? She said, he's lucky because he's got his dad around. Can't remember what else she said, but basically that was what she said. I'm going to cry now. Right. Stop, Dave. First, First one in the series. That's what our father's going to be like. You're going to hate it by the end, aren't you? Me standing here. But it's true. God is our father. And we're going to learn about what that means, ever present. Um, How might we reflect that to our children, to those around us, by the way that we live? God isn't actually a man, 
right? God is spirit. But if God primarily chooses to describe himself using the, the male pronoun, he must have a reason for that. We can't deny it whilst we take the whole of God's character. Do you remember the, the novel The Shack a few years ago? It caused quite a stir, didn't it, in portraying God as a black woman. Um, there's nowhere in Scripture that describes God as white or black, um, but Jesus does teach us as his followers to call God our Father. So let's work out what that means. So, two things today. Yeah, uh, three things today. Can we call God our Father? Yes, we can. But secondly, God was the father of Israel in the Old Testament. Let's think about that for a few minutes. Um, in John chapter 5, as Jesus described his relationship with, with God, the Jewish leaders were outraged. They were outraged. Why? Partly because Jesus was, as it says here, John chapter 5, he was even calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. They couldn't accept that, that Jesus was actually God, claiming to be God. But also, the Jews did not envisage God as a close father in the way that Jesus was now encouraging his followers to relate to God. They didn't get it. They couldn't get it. Didn't understand it. However, when we look at the Old Testament, we do see God described as father. He is described like that, and we want to just uh, recognize it. When the Jews were captive in Egypt, and God called Moses to be, to be instrumental in their release, he, he told Moses to go to Pharaoh and say to him that Israel is my firstborn son. Let my son go so that he may worship me. God was recognizing the nation as his son, as his children, but as his son, prominent in his family. In the, the few explicit times when the Old Testament actually calls God Father to the nation. We see this one here from Isaiah chapter 64. Isaiah calls out, cries out to God and says, Yet you, Lord, are our Father. We are the clay, you are the potter. We are all the work of your hand. Israel recognized God as its and their creator. He made them. He formed them. But God also reassured them. He wasn't just their creator, but they were also his treasure. He treasured them. He loved them so much. What had he done for them? We think back to, to, to Exodus on, and then onwards. God had rescued his people from slavery done everything he could and needed to do to bring them out of that situation. He brought them into the promised land and provided all that they needed, blessing from him. He formed a covenant with them, a tight bond, an unwavering commitment. He wanted the very best for them as he brought them into that intimate relationship as, the, as children and him as the Father God. And the very best that God wanted for Israel as a nation was for them to turn to him in submission, in obedience, and in trust that God and his ways were the best way for life, that he was a good God, that, that following him is worth it. His desire, we think of this image of the potter and the clay, God's desire for them, think about them for, for a moment, was to shape and mould them to become more like him so that they might be reflective of God's character See, Isaiah here, as he follows on from, that, from those words, um, uh, he's actually calling for God's mercy because the context of this prayer is that, that Israel had turned from God. From, in the promised land, they'd rejected God and lived lives that were um, unfaithful to him and they were exiled away from the land. Isaiah is calling to God for mercy, that, that, that God would forgive them and reshape them into the people that he wanted them to be. God, we're sorry, he's saying. Make us back into those people that you, you long for us to be, to reflect you more fully. That's what Isaiah is praying. And in, in, even in the Old Testament, we see God describing his, his relationship with Israel in intensely personal ways. Remember that reading from Isaiah that Adam read for us just now, if you've got it open. We see, don't we, verse 1. But now, this is what the Lord says he cre who created you, Jacob, he who formed you, Israel, do not fear, for I have redeemed you. I have summoned you by name. You are mine. 
So God made them. But for what? For what purpose did God make them? God made them for himself. You are mine, God says. You are mine. Now that sense that Israel was God's possession may be seen or viewed by our modern minds as very controlling. God owns, God owned them, God owns people, God owns me. What I want to accept, it's far from that though, isn't it? Far from being restrictive, it's, it's, it's the complete opposite. <laughs> um, uh, uh, if God made us, then of course God owns us. We were nothing. We were nothing. We didn't even exist before God planned and designed us and then put our being into existence. We were nothing. Of course we belong to God. But even more than that, when David in, in the Psalms describes and prays and acknowledges that he is fearfully and wonderfully made by God, he knew that every detail of his physical his emotional, his mental self was designed by a God who is the definition of love. And if the one who is love calls us into a deep relationship with him, it is for no other reason than the fact that he wants you to thrive in your life. To thrive because we were made to know God and to be close to him the father with his children. That was what Israel was designed for, to know God and to thrive in God. Of course, the New Testament describes how Christians belong to God. Remember this verse here, where Paul says, do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you receive from God? You are not your own. You were bought with a price. Therefore, honor God with your body. Jesus Christ, when he died on the cross, he, he's redeemed us, he's bought us with his own blood, his own body. He paid the price with his life to bring us out of the slavery to sin into a relationship with God for a new purpose, a new life. We're not our own anymore if we're in Christ. But that, isn't that a great thing? Because apart from God, we'd make a mess of everything and be lost forever. Go back to Isaiah and Isaiah describes the lengths that God went to win back his wayward children. Can you see the way that God describes himself and his people? He says, he says in verse 1, he's their redeemer. He's their saviour. He says in verse 4, you are precious and honoured in my sight. I love you. He calls them his sons and daughters. And he did whatever it took to bring, bring back to him everyone who is called by his name, whom he created for his glory, whom he formed and made. Verse 1 says that God summoned his people by name, but in verse 7, God is very clear that they're called by my name. <laughs> Tying up his identity with theirs. He says, by my name, it's me, it's my voice that calls you and you are connected so tightly with me that... This incredible bond, this covenant that I have made means that my identity and yours are so tightly linked. We bear his very name. So Israel was created and formed by God to thrive in a close relationship with God in order to live a life of glory to God. This is what Israel was existing for, not just, yes, to be protected from the sin and the evil ways of, of those around them, but, but also to shine distinctively so that everyone could see what it means to know and be in relationship with God, to be his children, for him to be their father. God said, I will make you as a light for the nations that my salvation might reach to the ends of the earth. God's people were there to show the world who God is and how anyone could know him. Brings us to this point here. God is our Father for all who are in Christ. Because God's making and choosing and loving and redeeming the nation of Israel through the Old Testament is a picture of God, what God would do more fully and completely for the world through Jesus Christ. In God's perfect wisdom, God knew and planned history before he created the world. He knew it all in advance. And he knew that he would choose 
people from before time began to come into relationship with him, to be called sons and daughters of God who would be their father, to find their place in life through finding God, to be adopted as his children through Jesus Christ. God knew all of that in advance. No mistake, no, nothing by chance. With all the questions that you might have around that, and I'll refer to something later on where you can go for questions, let that be a reassurance to you if you are a Christian. God knew, God planned. God had it in hand. And God knew you before you ever were born. God made us and he knew that we would reject him because of our sin, but he already had the rescue plan in place. The cross was always plan A, never plan B or C. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace. God is both our creator and he is our saviour. There was a story of a boy, a young boy, who made a, a boat out of wood. And one day he took the boat down to a lake to enjoy sailing the boat on the lake. After a little while, a storm blew up so much that the boat um, blew out of range of, of where the boy was. And it, and it got quite far away and got caught up in the rocks. And the boy managed, after a period of time, to sort of get himself round and get over to the boat to rescue the boat from the rocks and being shattered by the weather. And the boy was so delighted as he picked the boat up and as he lifted it up, he said, you are mine twice. Why? The boat was his first because he made it and formed it as he wanted it to be. But he, it was in a sense that boat became almost lost to him, but he went and won that boat back and he'd saved it and brought it back to him. The boat was his twice. We are God's twice if we are in Christ. If you uh, know Jesus, then you know God not just made you, but God has saved you in Jesus Christ and you are his twice. He's brought you back to him. What a comfort that is. Ephesians carries on as we heard just now. You were also included in Christ when you heard the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation. When you believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit. We can know God as our Father through the Saviour, Jesus Christ. A different emphasis, isn't there, with the Old Testament. The nation of Israel was known as a son, God as its Father, but much more explicit in the New Testament. Jesus, in the way that he taught, but also taken up by the writers of the, of the New Testament. The fact that each of us, individually, can know God personally as our Father. Galatians describes it like this. So in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith in him, in Christ. So I encourage you today, is this your time to turn to Christ? To turn to Jesus to know that you are saved from all those things in your life that you know aren't right, the sin that has blocked you from God. Jesus, through the cross, is God's way of winning us back to him that we might be children and him as our father. Turn to Jesus today. We are God's children in God's family. We're created, we're known, we're chosen, we're called, we're saved, we're forgiven. Why? that we might experience and enjoy God. You're a Christian. Do you enjoy God? Are you enjoying God? Right now, knowing him, being close to him. Uh, Jonathan Edwards, the, uh, the Puritan preacher, said this. He said, there's a difference between believing that God is holy and gracious and having a new sense on the heart of the loveliness and beauty of that holiness and grace. The difference be between believing that God is gracious and tasting that God is gracious is as different as having a rational belief that honey is sweet and having the actual sense of its sweetness. Like, you can sit there and look at the jar of honey. You can say, someone's told me that honey's sweet. I believe them. You haven't tasted it yet. You're a Christian. Turn to Christ. 
I want you to believe, not just believe in your head that God is your father, but your experience of God as God as your father is a sweet thing. That you enjoy him. That it's not just something we talk about, but it's something that you are experiencing day by day. So that we don't turn up on a Sunday and we don't go through the motions and we don't just say the right things, but we live in such a way that we know it in our hearts, our experience. It's my prayer for you. Maybe we need some growth in our understanding of who God is. And like I said earlier, maybe we need some healing to relate to God in the way that he wants to draw close to us. So, God's desire is that we should enjoy him, but also that we're shaped by him to glorify him. That's why I asked at the beginning of the service. You know, think about those questions. Those questions that we looked at on the 2nd of January. What's of value in my life? Who do I want to be? How am I going to walk with God? What am I going to do to enhance my relationship with him? Um, So I want to ask you again, you know, how might you glorify God in your life? How might he shape you as the potter and you as the clay in such a way that you are becoming more like him? How might you live that out in your relationships? Um, How might he affect your, your words and your actions whether that's at home or um, at work or at college or at school or in the clubs you're involved in or with your neighbours. What does it mean to, to glorify God by the way that you are, your whole person? Talked about bearing the name of God. If we are a Christian, we literally bear the name of Christ, don't we? We are Christians. We bear his name. And the, the Bible says... Um, We are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. We are living for Jesus to help people to see Jesus, to come to know Jesus, that they also might enter God's family. So how might we engage and connect with those around us? Those who might have some sense of God, but don't know who he is. How might we use our lives and the gospel to draw people closer to him. Paul did it, didn't he, in in, um, Acts 17. Do you remember when he was in Athens and he um, sought to understand those people and the culture around him? And even those that were quoting the poets and the the philosophers of the day who recognized that there was a a, a creator, but he seemed distant. They recognized that there was a God and we were his offspring, but they didn't know him personally. God used his relationship with Jesus and his knowledge of God to, 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 to draw them into a better understanding of who God really is. How might we do that? You know, our, our whole strap line is to grow as lifelong disciples of Jesus. So as you're growing, as we grow here on a Sunday, as on, on a Tuesday in our one-to-one times with each other, we should be shaped, and we're shaped more like children of God so that we live in the world with others who don't know him and they can see in us and they can hear from us Who is God? How might they be drawn to know him too? That's part of us glorifying him. So there we go. We are made by God to be shaped for his glory as we know him as Father. Would our prayer be like Paul did at the end of Philippians chapter 4? Would we be able to pray this? To God, our God, And our Father, be glory in the world, in our lives, so that others might see it. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you are our creator. We're not randomly here. We exist because you decided to make us, each one of us, Every single one of us, you've made a a decision, designed us. We thank you, God, that you're not just a creator, but you're you're a lover. You're the one who formed us intimately and intricately. Every detail of our lives, we're not here by chance, but we're here because a personal God has made us. But we thank you that you've called us to yourself through Jesus. You've called us away from our sin and our waywardness back into relationship with you, closeness with you. 
our Father and us as your children. I pray, pray through our series that you would help us to know you better, to find healing, to be your children, to live for your glory and to enjoy you. And so we thank you and praise you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.